Well, I think God, in speaking to Job, really put the ball in the court of man. And of course, when we start asking the question, life before creation, of course there was life before creation. God existed before creation. The angels existed before creation. So the answer to the question is not dinosaurs or anything like that. It's simply that God was there from the beginning. And once we get that fundamental truth into our minds and begin to realize that the omnipotent creator that we've come to know and to worship and to embrace, all things then begin to fall into place. God is always right. And it takes some sort of time in our learning and absorbing the word of God and seeing the irrefutability of the word of God, the way it all dovetails together from Genesis to Revelation, that at the end of it all, brothers and sisters, you prostrate yourself to the ground, you bend the knee, and you go before the eternal creator in prayer, and you recognize that we are but dust and ashes, except for his mercy. And I feel sure those who are here today and any visitors that we might have online, and if there are any visitors online, welcome. Oh, we can put the message across to you. Go, you can understand what we're saying. But this is a riveting subject when we start looking at it from a scriptural point of view. See, in that little reading that we had, uh, presiding brother Michael read for us, we have one or two little truths that come sort of rippling across as we listen to the words that have been said. For in verse 4 we have, when I laid the foundations of the earth. Well, if you're thinking of a natural building, uh, the building's not there until the foundations have been laid. And somebody has to lay the foundations. And therefore, God laid the foundation of the earth, of the universe, of everything we perceive and see. There's no beginning and no end. We cannot get our mind around that. We have finite minds. We are dealing with the infinite. And what a wonderful thing it is, you know. Uh, when you, how can I put this? When you know the truth in all of its reality and you get the Bible in front of you and you're reading your Bible, we do read the Bible um, once the Old Testament, twice the New Testament every year, and it comes around, we're always picking up something new, and you begin to let the penny drop that we've really found something so precious. And the world at large doesn't want to know. Neighbours don't want to know. One of my neighbours came knocking at my door one day and said, uh, uh, Gerald, would you, would you like a Bible? <laughs> but she says, I know you've already got a thousand. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. So what impression they have, I don't know. There's one thing they do know. I, hardly spoken to her before but they see you go on a Sunday morning you know you see your wife put the hat on and and, and you're looking your Sunday best and they went where are they going and it begins to sort of drop it's like with our children when we're raising our children you bring them the meat and the break in the bread the bread go past the wine goes past the bread go past the wine goes past uh, and 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 they know mum and dad have their disagreements they probably saw mum the night before chasing her husband around with a frying pan. But they know that that doesn't mean a thing. There's something more important in their lives. And there is. But like everything else, you have to get the evidence. You have to get the information. You have to get the confidence. I mean, if you're going abroad, if we, we've been fortunate to go abroad once or twice, we went to Turkey. Well, I could only think of, you know, the Arabian Nights. I wondered why we were going, you know. And, and I wanted to know about it. What was the place like? You know, anybody been there before? What's the meals like, you know? Are you a little bit upset with your tummy every night? I needed to find these sort of things out. And when I asked somebody who'd been, they said, oh, but why? There's not, not, nothing to worry about. Confidence. And that's what you have to get. You have to get a knowledge of the truth. It's not, you know, Jesus loves you. Down into the water, get wet. It's not that at all. It's gaining a knowledge so you're absolutely irrevocably convinced in the Bible. And when that, when you get to that point, then you begin to see things unfolding. And it, it brings comfort and patience. It brings contentment. Now, Job had got that. 
and God was giving him a little bit of a ripping here. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job. Whereupon all the foundations of the earth are fastened? Job. He goes on to say, when the morning stars sang together, in other words, the angelic host, all were rejoicing at the wonderful creation. When God, when the sons of God shouted for joy, and then we find who shut the sea and with doors. In other words, you, you go to the seaside, all being well, we're going to be off to Weymouth on Monday. I know you're envious. Your time will come. And, and uh, you see, <laughs> you, <laughs> but, you know, I can't help but be excited about it because that's the way it is. You know, you see the sea come in, you see the sea go out, you see the sea come in, you can see the sea. And there's a boundary, there's a wall there, you see. It didn't just happen. <laughs> And when you get a knowledge of the truth, the penny begins to drop, doesn't it? Well, well, what I'm going to try and do in the short time that we've got, and I hope listeners, um, if there's any listener listening on Zoom in terms of um, interested friends, I, I hope we can verbally get it across to you. Okay, let's see if we can get this across to you. Now, words that we know so well, but we're going to build upon these words and we're going to follow it through. In John chapter one, words we know, I know, we read these words. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, I'm reading a word. To the Englishman, a word is a word, you know, it's whatever it is. But the word in terms of the Bible is the word logos. And it's a declaration or intention. So what we read there, in the beginning was the intention or the purpose. And the word or the intention or the purpose was with God. And the purpose and the intention was God. So when we're reading the Bible, we're reading that there's a purpose, there's a declaration. There's a driving force that's being produced within the words that we read. Psalm 33 at verse 6 reads these words. By the word, the Lord, and um, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. What's he saying? What, what, what's being said in that psalm? Well, what is being said in that psalm is the purpose the word went forth to declare the heavens and the earth. That was the intention, that was the purpose, and that's what happened. Well, I, you know. <laughs> I mean, man can't do that. I can't even do it in my own household. Never mind what's happening here. This word of God went forth and his word brought results. It says, he gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layers up depths in storehouses. So the depths of the sea are held there in storehouses, like you store whatever you do store. The seas are stored and held in check. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe. Do they stand in awe? No. Climate change, weather changing, storms, rain, flood, wilderness. I've got no idea that God is controlling all of these events. But to those who know the word of God, know that these events will come upon the earth and it brings about a comfort in a strange way that you know that these events are controlled by God. Isaiah said these words, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not hither, but watereth the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of the mouth. So as the rain come down, you see in the spring and the growth and the flowers and the beauty of the, 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 the creation of God, God's word comes down and it brings about a response. Now, you may be listening tonight or this afternoon, listener. The word of God is coming to you like rain coming from heaven. And it will either make you grow and take interest in the truth, or it will simply fall on the paths and gently go away into the drains and to wherever it goes after that. His word is like that. It brings forth fruit. Now, notice there's a similarity 
So God's word is a declaration. It's his purpose. It's his intention. So when you're reading his word, it has that meaning behind it. But listen to the, the wise man, Solomon, speaking of wisdom. Listen what he has to say regarding wisdom. He says these words. To know wisdom, this is Proverbs 1, verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction to perceive words of understanding. The Lord, say, he says these words, and now what he's doing, he's personifying wisdom. He's portraying wisdom as a person. He says, the Lord possessed me wisdom in the beginning of his way and before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. Now, where have we heard those words before? Just reading them, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And now we're reading, in the beginning was the wisdom, and the wisdom was with God. So what's being crystallized here? I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. Similar language. So there's a message being put across here. That is an important message. The message is this, that the word is God. And it was there with God at the beginning. Wisdom is God. And wisdom was there at the beginning. So wisdom and the word, the declaration, the intention, wisdom and all what it entails has emanated from God. Today's modern education, today's modern professors, these in their various domains of superiority, have all learned, really, and had their wisdom and knowledge from the great source, which is God, but, of course, have abused it and never taken any notice regarding the word of God. So wisdom, then, and the word is God. So when we talk about wisdom, the infinite source is God. When we talk about the word of God, the declaration of God, the purpose of God and all that we see, it was God. God was there. Wisdom was there. The word was there at the beginning, before anything else was created. Look now at his spirit power. He divideth the sea with his power, Job 26. And for his understanding, he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Now, everything we see, everything we see is by God. The word, wisdom, the power or spirit all comes from God. And God is the possessor of all these things in the infinite sense. There's no limitation of his wisdom. There's no limitation of his understanding and declaration of the word and what he can do with that word. And there's no limitation in terms of his spirit power. Omnit uh, the omniscience and omnipot omnipotence and omniscience of God. Well, now that's our God. It's not worshiping some kind of, I have to be careful, but you're not worshiping, say, an idol. You know, something made out of wood, you got a piece of wood, and you make it out of a piece of wood, make it an idol, shape it like something you want to worship, and then with the rest of the wood you burn it, and it'll burn. <laughs> it's nonsense, isn't it, when you think about it. <laughs> and the Bible talks about it, they make these idols out of wood, then burn the wood that they made them out of and worship the idols. What a nonsense. And so we find, brothers and sisters, and dear friends, and those who are listening, the marvel of a God that we have, a living God. And forget the gobbledygook, jumbo nonsense that we listen to around the world, who speak with authority but have never really read the word of God. I've found over the years that the Bible has given me great comfort. To put it bluntly, Michael, it warms a black countryman's heart when you're reading the Bible. It's a comfort when you have it 
spoken as it should be spoken, you know, not with these smooth, rounding words that you all go around on cloud nine. You've got to get the reality of it. Isaiah says these words. Now saith the Lord that for me from the womb to be his servant. It's speaking of Christ. Christ was formed in the womb of Mary. It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to resor, restore the preserved of Israel. My salvation will be from the ends of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, Christ, to him whom man despise, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall arise, princes also shall be worshipped, of course, the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. As you get to know the Bible, dear listener, as you get to know the Bible, you begin to realize that there's a calling involved. And that calling brings about an interest in the scriptures from the start, and then you start looking out of interest, and that interest develops until that development grows in the womb, as it were, of the mind, and a birth brings forth. And that's what we try to bring about in the talks that we have, to try and get the message across of this inciting narrative and our understanding of the Bible. No wonder, you know, the different ones who were sort of saved in the Bible that you read of, they went away rejoicing. It is a rejoicing matter. To think that you know that God is going to enshrine himself upon this earth, enthrone himself upon this earth through his beloved son at Jerusalem. So, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, of truth. And what that is saying, and we know so well, that word was made flesh was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was made flesh and he had the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding the word spirit the spirit word of wisdom was now expressed in the personal pronoun of he he now the lord jesus christ takes upon these qualities of the father and so we find words like this in isaiah the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And those, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ takes that verse from Isaiah chapter 61, and he applies it directly to himself in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to raise, as he said there, to raise the captives that are bound. Who are the captives? How are they bound? Well, you've only got to go down the graveyard to see the reality of that. The graveyards are full of people who have been bound and never found the way of release. But here the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that he can release you from that concept, from that reality. The unbinding, as it were, that binds people into the ground. And the reason, you see, by coming to a knowledge of the truth, you begin to come to a knowledge of the purpose of God. And once you understand the purpose of God is to fill this, his earth, this earth with his glory, as the waters cover the deep. And then we say, what is his glory? We beheld his glory as the only begotten son of God. Well, what was the glory? Well, the glory was his life on earth, but the real glory is now he's immortal, deathless. And that's what's being promised to men and women who become baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ and take upon his saving name. This is the whole drive of the Bible. It's been written so he can bring about sons and daughters into his kingdom. Why does he need sons and daughters? Why does he need us? Because there's a universe out there that he needs immortal people 
to take control of. The earth wasn't just made. We read that it was done by his ministering spirits. He needs more angels. That's what he boils down to. We should be likened unto the angels to die no more. We can only be part. There is no difference between the angels of the future, of, of, of today, and the, the, those will be called saints of the future. We become deathless. Paul tells us in Ephesians, there's one family between heaven and earth. And the whole purpose is to bring about an increase. Is family. So that he then is the Lord Jesus Christ. He became the word, he became wisdom, he became spirit in the infinite sense. In the infinite sense, in this human nature that we have. The psalmist says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth and themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. What are we seeing now as taking place? <laughs> you know, we think of Armageddon, which will be pretty quickly executed. Uh, you've only got to look at the times of Ezekiah, uh, when 186,000 realized they were dead. <laughs> That's similar words to what he said in Isaiah. If he withdraws his breath and his spirit, we'd all cease to exist. But that's not his purpose. He's still trying to save people because he needs to, that's God, that is, Yahweh, needs to have a family. Yet have I set my king, his anointed king, upon my holy hill of Zion. And he's talking in reality of the future. It's not happened yet. But God is so sure that it will happen. Nothing can stop, him, stop it happening. When Christ gave up the spirit on the stake, and said, it is finished, the whole uh, panorama of events then could be put into motion. Men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be released from the grave. Those of the future who associated them with Christ would come out of the grave. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. But we ask the question, when was Christ begotten? Turn with me to Acts chapter 13. And we find there in Acts chapter 13, this expression is used. And we come in at verse 33 of Acts chapter 13. We read there verse 33, and it's Paul at Antioch. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he, that's God, raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So Christ was begotten, not at his baptism, although he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Christ was begotten from the dead when he came out of that grave, which we alluded to this morning. And we find also, we all give you the sure mercies of David. Now, what are the sure mercies of David? Well, we know the promises of David, that David would see, um, would see Christ. He would be there, the finality of the resurrection. We know in Daniel chapter 7, we read there where the clouds of heaven, when Christ ascended from the Mount of Olives, he made a direct route to the Father in heaven. That cloud of witnesses that took him, the cloud of angels that took him to his father in heaven. And we read in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man, namely Christ, came with the clouds of heaven, namely the angels, 
you don't have natural clouds in heaven. You don't have natural clouds flowing all the way up into heaven. This was a cloud of angels and came to the ancients of days, namely God, and they brought him near before him. Notice the personal pronoun, him, who's the him? God, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom that will not, shall not be destroyed. Sure mercies of David. When he ascended from the Mount of Olives, Daniel 7, he went to his father. The angelic host took him to his father and there he received this honour from his father. And from that time, all the angels now are under the supervision of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says there, a dominion, an everlasting dominion. And so we read of the sure mercies of David in 2nd of Samuel. And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, David, and I will set up thy seat after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. David, you're going to die, you're going to go in the grave, but you'll come out of that grave, and your greatest son, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, will sit upon your throne. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The same as what we've just read in Daniel chapter 7 and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. It, it's so difficult to listeners uh, who have taken an interest or coming online for the first time uh, to get this message across. But what I'm trying to do is get it across to you that may stimulate interest, that will make you realise that the word of God is irrefutable. Once you begin to realise how it all doves, doves, dovetails together, over 30 different writers over a period of 1,500 years, all saying the same thing, and all of their sayings sort of lining up, as it were, to give one powerful message of salvation. And so when we come to the Gospel of Luke, which we were looking at this morning, what do we read there? We read, he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Just read it. Just read it in Second of Samuel, which was a thousand years before what we just read there in Luke's gospel. We've just read it regarding what was to take place when Christ went up into heaven to receive the authority to continue the work and bring, bring about this rea reality. Turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. We see at Isaiah chapter 11, we see another sort of aspect of it all when we start thinking in the way that we're trying to put it across this afternoon to anyone who might be listening and also to ourselves. Notice the words. Now, this is a messianic chapter. In other words, it speaks of Christ. And notice the words that we have in Isaiah chapter 11, speaking of Christ. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that's Christ, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Morning by morning he wakeneth me, we read of in Isaiah chapter 15. And we know that the word and the spirit of wisdom, uh, these attributes that God has in the ultimate sense was eventually to sort of dwell with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we have it. The spirit of your, Yahweh, or the spirit of the Lord, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of knowledge. It was an astonishing manifestation of God, brothers and sisters, in the period of, of those three and a half years that Christ was on the earth. And so at a time appointed, a set time appointed, God intervened, and he had to intervene to bring about the salvation of man. Israel had deteriorated and degenerated into utter decadence. And so he sends forth his own begotten son. He was the word. He was wisdom. And he was the spirit. And he declared him, and he made a connection, the power of God acted on the womb of Mary when that angel Gabriel told Mary 
and the Holy Spirit of God acted on the womb of Mary. And that child in the womb of Mary, brothers and sisters, and anyone listening, was formed in the womb of Mary. That would be a moral prodigy of the, of the caliber and the type the world had never seen. His mind, his capability, his understanding and ability to understand would be unsurpassed. This wasn't circumventing and cheating in any way. He had all the weaknesses and failings that we had. But he had the power in terms of his mind to take on the word of God. And so at the time he was 30 and was baptized, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we read in John that he received the, the spirit, the power, without measure. He'd already got the wisdom. He'd already got an understanding of the Logos. And then the Spirit was given to him without power. He's standing in awe. When we think that 2,000 years ago, those who were alive at that time, the privilege that they had as he walked the length and breadth of Israel, an astonishing manifestation at a time appointed God brought about and raised a son that on his behalf to portray God himself to man, his intention and his purpose and his love and his compassion in a way that had never been seen before. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth him not the spirit by measure. John chapter 3. Here then we have the one born to be king and ruler of the world that will soon take control of this earth. And although any listeners that are listening for the first time will not understand this, but we have been saying so now for 150 years. You can open some of our books and you think you're reading tomorrow's newspapers. That's our accurate. Our understanding is of prophecy. There's certain things we haven't always got right. But by and large, the final understanding is something that we've understood from our understanding of the world. So we do not take on the sort of view of the church. It's not that we deride the church. We feel sorry for their lack of understanding in terms of as we understand it. But many you do and go to church and they sing their hymns and that I would suggest to you they don't understand. And certainly at Christmas time, which is only a few months away when they'll be singing, Hark the herald angels sing glory to a newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. I doubt if they understand the words. <laughs> nice words. But you've got to have an understanding up here to really appreciate what's being said so the manifestation of god in the lord jesus christ was a true mirror reflection of himself reflecting his entire mental and moral attributes yet astonishingly he never sinned in the nature that we bear he never sinned and that is something we really can't get our minds around brethren and sisters. We're going to leave it at that. And so when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we look at his ministry in that. But remember that he had the word with all its ultimate understanding. He had wisdom with all of its ultimate understanding. And he had the power and the spirit with all of its ultimate standing, ultimate understanding. He could say to the raging sea of Galilee, be still. And that raging sea became a mill pond. Astonishing. And he could say to a leper, be clean. And it was clean. Why? Because the word was a declaration and an intent. Be clean. And that was the intent. And it happened. And so will it be, brothers and sisters, at the last trump, as 
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, and those, in de those asleep in Christ will be raised to immortality, and those things are shortly to be upon us. Thank you very much. Everyone.